Thank you, Ismail. Let me begin by uh, uh, thanking Maral for her boundless energy uh, and the invitation to uh, speak here today. Uh, if she were to say that she spent two hours in the OR before this morning's session, I would absolutely believe her. <laughs> uh, also, let me uh, reassure you that thus far, Donald Trump has not started World War III, but the morning is still young in South America. <laughs> so there are advantages and disadvantages to being a later speaker in the morning session. Uh, one is you're never quite sure what uh, the predecessors uh, will have said. Uh, and that's why I kept the title of my talk very general. Um, there's also the risk that you have included some of the slides that they have quote unquote loaned you over the years. <laughs> so this is rather incestuous, these kinds of sessions. But the good news is you can sit in the back and delete some of those slides uh, in preparation. So uh, please don't see this as condescending, uh, but <laughs> it's, it's to emphasize what most of you already know, that the uh, aorta is not a single tube. And uh, some of the discussion thus far will have emphasized that, um, if not explicitly. And because the embryologic origins of the aorta differ, depending on the segments, um, they're more prone to certain pathologic uh, uh, misadventures, as, as you will. And we're certainly focusing on the ascending uh, and descending thoracic portions of the aorta. And particularly in young people, we rarely need to consider atherosclerosis as a predisposing factor um, or inflammation. And so that underlies some of what uh, I want to mention. On the other hand, we always have to focus on history at least those of us who are somewhat older. And uh, some of you already know who the first reported case of a dissection was. And um, George II uh, died while sitting in the loo, which has always emphasized to me the importance of recommending against Valsalva maneuvers. <laughs> um, but his autopsy showed that he had uh, a dilated ascending aorta that had dissected. Unfortunately, we can't do genetic testing at this point, but um, we know that uh, aortic dissection is not particularly uncommon and that the risk factors in general are um, being Caucasian, being a male, increased age, and hypertension. Uh, few, if any, of those predisposing factors have entered into the discussion thus far this, this morning. Uh, and we know the high mortality associated with acute aortic dissection, particularly if they don't find uh, quick uh, evacuation to one of the centers that we all represent. And uh, in general terms, uh, people classify aortic diseases as non-familial and familial, and we've heard a lot about that. But I think the question mark here is an important one that uh, we all need to be focusing on uh, in our continued research. Now here is a slide that I did borrow from Diana Milowitz, and I re-show it because of the importance of um, Michael DeBakey in my view. He was certainly the first great aortic surgeon, but I've always been um, interested in the irony of him having suffered an acute aortic dissection despite being an aortic surgeon. And I'll return to the notion of irony in a short while. Um, here again, there needs to be no further elaboration on this, uh, but I do want to emphasize how common bicuspid aortic valve is. And we've heard a fair amount about that um, already, and that um, the embryologic origin of the aortic valve, the ascending aorta, and the periductal region of the aorta uh, 
are similar. And that's why we often see that triad associated with, uh, associated, uh, with each other. Um, and the aortic root is often not dilated. Um, and here are some of the causes, including some of the genetic ones. And I'll particularly emphasize uh, a paper published this month, and this is mainly to steal some of Hal Dietz's thunder since uh, his group reported this. Um, but I want to show this uh, case uh, of a heavily calcified aortic valve that was both regurgitant and uh, highly stenotic. And the ascending aorta, which was mildly dilated with normal sinuses. I thank uh, my close colleague, Joe Bavaria, for these pictures. And at the time of these pictures, I was much closer to him because uh, these are my photos. And we're following the ascending aorta um, closely, to say the least. So here's my other point of irony, I think. Um, and I also want to include this slide mainly to emphasize my mentor, Victor McCusick, and how important he was in um, my education and the education of, of uh, millions of individuals, and particularly professors. And um, also to emphasize that virtually everyone that he introduced me to uh, as Marfan syndrome uh, had feature syndromic features but as we now know, many of those folks didn't have classic Marfan syndrome, uh, just like Marfan's original patient didn't have Marfan syndrome. Um, and that um, the natural history of aortic dilatation is pretty well understood at this point. It can be present at birth. Um, the rate of dilatation is variable. Um, and the dilatation rarely progresses even beyond the mid-ascending aorta. There are clearly exceptions that we've all seen. But here's a patient of mine who, over the course of a decade, showed uh, progressive dilatation. And these are data looking at our youngest patients many years ago, showing, again, that the dilatation can be congenital uh, and progresses at different rates. Um, these data were before the um, advent of medical therapy, uh, that indicates how long ago these patients were evaluated. And I also want to include this picture because I think we owe a large debt to uh, Hugh Bentall, Mr. Hugh Bentall, the London surgeon who developed the composite graft approach, which has saved countless lives, not only of Marfan patients, but uh, patients in general with dilated sinuses. And my colleague, uh, Vincent Gott at Johns Hopkins, who taught me an awful lot about um, cardiothoracic surgery, just enough to be dangerous, I think, um, but who um, worked with me over a decade and a half to evaluate how composite graft surgery uh, was effective in people with Marfan syndrome. And I also owe a debt to this surgeon, Stan Crawford, who um, was the first, I think, uh, to show us how to repair the entire aorta. Um, and this is, if not commonplace, certainly something that is performed routinely. We now have um, medical therapy that um, began with propranolol, again, in the dark ages, and showed that the rate of dilatation was lessened in people who were treated aggressively with beta blockade. So here are all the um, factors that have led to improved life expectancy in Marfan syndrome. And this improved life expectancy was documented first um, a couple of decades ago. Uh, here are treated patients uh, and untreated patients. So you see there's substantial increase and more recent data, which I won't show, uh, show that this is even more improved today uh, compared to two decades ago. Now, this emphasizes what you have all heard repeatedly this morning, the syndromic nature of many of the conditions that we deal with, uh, both uh, Marfan, Lois Dietz, ACTA-2, uh, 
with its multiple um, uh, arterial as well as non-arterial non manifestations. And also you've heard emphasized that the first and most important genetic test is the family history in all directions. Um, and we've done an analysis at Penn that has shown that in relatively few cases of uh, aortic dilatation, even in young people, you search through the electronic health record and you don't find um, a, a family history that's at all informative for the kind of answers that you're looking for. Um, now, we've talked about needing to get information about relatives, but it's difficult for you and I to actually get this information directly. So it's important for us to um, twist the arm of our patients and encourage them to be the ones to go out and get this information. Um, because I don't think we can contact relatives without consent. Um, so traditionally, screening of relatives has involved uh, imaging. But that's difficult in the situation where uh, dissection or rupture can occur in the absence of dilatation. And there's such phenotypic heterogeneity within a family that it's tough to rely simply on imaging. And biochemical testing uh, is not helpful at this point. And uh, you've heard something about molecular genetic testing and the uh, ability to obtain DNA has uh, become markedly uh, simpler. We can actually send a kit home with the patient and they can either spit or swab the cheek and send it off to the laboratory. Costs still vary. It's often covered uh, with a copay in the US, uh, not nearly as um, simple as here, I understand. And it's progressed to panels and increasingly to whole exomes and whole genomes. And if you can find a mutation, then clearly screening the relatives is relatively simple and um, uh, less expensive. Now, you also know that the results fall into five categories, uh, benign, likely benign, likely pathogenic, and pathogenic. Um, and we've heard also about variants of uncertain significance, which uh, are unfortunately fairly common and the bane of our existence in many respects. Um, and also, we've heard about the notion of screening relatives in the absence of a mutation. Um, and generally, I refrain from screening adults uh, if there's nothing, uh, sorry, screening children if there is nothing that you can do for them uh, at the point uh, of age. Um, and that doesn't hold for the conditions we're talking about today. So that there clearly is a reason to identifying uh, children as soon as possible at being at risk for an aortopathy. Um, so the benefits of testing include offering a patient reproductive risks. I certainly leave this discussion to my genetic counselors. You can uh, both advise and select medication and you can um, recommend a change in occupation or for young people how they might direct their education and interests into um, occupations that are less stressful physically and perhaps even mentally. Um, and there are these constant issues about exertion. Uh, how vigorous can someone with an aortopathy, for example, be? I learned the hard lesson uh, when I was just starting out that uh, you have to be very specific, if that's possible. Because I had a um, young adolescent who uh, found to have a dilated aorta, not at a surgical threshold, and I advised him to stop being a competitive track athlete he was very disappointed, and um, he asked, well, what can I do? And I said, well, you know, nice aerobic exercises like swimming and uh, 
vigorous walking and so forth. He came back the next year and proudly showed me the medal he had won in the breaststroke in the state swimming meet, which certainly wasn't what I had in mind when I made my recommendations. Now there are guidelines from the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association and probably other um, uh, organizations, but uh, it's tough to uh, apply those in any specific uh, case. So I just re recommend to avoid exertion uh, at maximal capacity, avoid isometrics, um, avoid heavy lifting, avoid Valsalva, uh, and then discuss with them exactly what they're interested in doing. Now we've heard about the um, results of genetic testing and how it can be very useful in managing uh, a patient and a family. But you know, things change. And a result that you obtain today may be interpreted differently in a year, in either direction, less pathologic or more pathologic. And while these kinds of reinterpretation focus on the variance of uncertain significance, it can actually extend further along the continuum. So that presents a dilemma. Who's responsible for monitoring these changes in evaluation? Sometimes it's the laboratory who does this out of good intentions or maybe a competitive spirit to stay ahead of their um, competitive laboratories. But if it's not the laboratory, who else might be responsible? And even the reinterpretation may be sent to someone who's not uh, in a situation to re-consult the, the patient. Um, and this is particularly true, increasingly, if it's not a medical geneticist who's ordering the test. Or even if the uh, medical geneticist has only seen the patient once and never intended to see them again, and the laboratory um, uh, comes up with a modification, uh, who do they contact, particularly if the patient's been lost to follow-up? So this is an actual case where you see um, I was evaluating a patient uh, and the results of the genetic testing had been negative and he says, well, you'll certainly let me know when you're smarter. And since I was hassled, I said, sure. And then my genetic counselor off in the corner went like this, because, um, you know, we're not set up to keep track of all these mutations, and indeed, we still aren't. And uh, what's our responsibility to recontact a patient if we indeed do become smarter? I mean, it seems obvious that we should do this, but if that hadn't been a patient I had seen for a decade, um, and had only seen once, what uh, could I do? And as I said, what if a non-geneticist ordered the test? So this isn't a new dilemma. We've actually been facing this for quite a while now, mainly through the American College of Medical Genetics. Um, and this first interpretation was even before medical genetic testing was um, au courant. And I reevaluated this a few years ago, and this has led to a number of international efforts to look at our ability to annotate the USs, eliminate some of the uncertainties, but um, are we indeed getting smarter? And so we uh, re-evaluated our responsibilities, and this is in press and should come out in the next month or so, um, and emphasizes the dilemmas that we continue to face about recontacting people um, when we are smarter. So let me finish by one of my most important messages, I think. Um, when we take care of a patient and give him or her 
treatment. We then follow those treatments, and that's clinical history, right? What's happening after we intervene? And that has been much of the information you've already heard this morning. Um, but this alters the natural history of the disease. What would happen if we didn't intervene? Well, we also know what happens in many situations if we don't intervene. Um, but in fact, all those bad things that happen lead to a shortened natural history. <clears throat> and um, the, this I've summarized in a paper that's coming out uh, shortly. Uh, and the improved clinical history improves longevity and leads to new natural history. And we have to be quite aware of this and follow it along. So in Marfan syndrome, the fact that patients are living much longer has led to the emergence or worsening of a number of features beyond disease of the aorta, such as cysts, which are benign, typically, cardiomyopathy that develops even in the absence of valvular disease, um, more extensive arterial involvement, which is becoming evident, uh, sleep apnea, just to pick something that is uh, outside the cardiovascular realm. Um, so many of my patients' partners come in and complain about the patient snoring. And then the, some of the known manifestations, such as duralectasia and ophthalmologic uh, uh, features, can also work. Some. So I think in all of our situations, including patients we think have non-syndromic aortopathy, as they live longer, we have to stay attuned to the possibility that they will develop non-cardiovascular manifestations. So who's going to manage these folks going forward? I'd like to think that my cardiologic and surgical colleagues would do this, but I don't think so. So who is going to be educated enough to follow these folks um, as they live a long time. So there needs to be ongoing management, both of medication, exercise modulation, managing the whole patient for new clinical issues, psychosocial issues, educating them, and I think there is a vital role for support organizations, um, and we need to continue doing uh, our clinical, translational, and basic research. And I want to praise um, uh, an organization that has been successfully looking at various aortopathies in the United States, GENTAC, and then you've already heard about Montalcino and the important organization internationally that's become, and the support organizations such as GATA and the Marfan Foundation, the LDS Foundation play a crucial role in educating uh, our patients and supporting them. So let me uh, finish by pointing out that I'm privileged to work in the third oldest university in the United States and the oldest medical school in the United States. And um, here we are in West Philadelphia, and just to show how effective our interaction with patients can be, uh, this new research building is named after one of my Marfan families. So, be glad to answer any questions. So we'll just take a couple of brief questions and then we'll we can ask some more at the end. But sure. does anybody have any pressing questions? Oh, I satisfied everybody's yeah. curiosity. That's great. Thank you.